Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday, May 3rd. We're going to begin with just a few announcements. By the way, I'm Pastor Susan for Luther Memorial Lutheran Church. Um, the bishop has just put out a new pastoral letter and you will be copied on that soon. So look out um, in your email and mailbox for that letter. It's quite an extensive letter concerning reopening and what that would look like. But the target date has now been moved out to approximately July 1st. We, are, we expect to be worshiping in this manner for the next two months through June. So this is um, the first adjustment. The second adjustment will have to do with what gathered worship might look like when we begin again. There is also um, a brief discussion on communion and the bishop promises further discussions. We may have our own discussions as well. We'll get back to that um, as we look to communion in this service, but what I'm going to advise you now is that you may have heard that some of our congregations here in Central Crossroads have been celebrating communion in a virtual service. And for this service, people have created altars at home and provided their own elements. We are not doing that. My perspective on this is that we are going to wait for the time being. However, I would not deny you the opportunity to worship with one of the other congregations that is celebrating communion in this way. I will let you know that this is against the advising of our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eden, and our synod bishop, John Mockholtz. Although Bishop Mockholtz has said that he will not penalize any pastors who do offer communion in this way. So there, there are plenty of topics for discussion and we will have further discussion on these matters. But mainly I want to let you know to look out for that pastoral letter. We'll begin worship today with our scriptures. The first reading is from the book of Acts chapter two, beginning at verse 42. And this concerns practices of the early church just after Pentecost. The baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Our Psalm today is the 23rd Psalm. And I encourage you to turn to that Psalm in whichever translation speaks to your heart. But I will read the translation we have here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, 
and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Our epistle today is from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 19. It is a credit to you if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our gospel today is John 10, verses 1 through 10. The gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me, will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
let's begin with the gospel. This is known as the Good Shepherd Discourse. Maybe it's the times we're in, but I have to admit that this scripture confuses me a bit at first. Jesus says that the sheep will not follow a stranger or hear the voice of thieves or bandits. But it seems to me that there are plenty of bandits and thieves about, that is, bad or corrupt leaders, and there are plenty of sheep who follow them. Now, as we face this unprecedented health crisis, it seems to me that we have never had a more desperate need for strong, healthy central leadership. Yet, Washington sends us mixed messages while flexing its muscle here or there, but more often ceding power to state and local governance. Often it seems that the governors and states are on their own as they combat this killer virus on our behalf, contending with one another as they compete for needed supplies or negotiating and supporting one another, or even undertaking themselves to negotiate with foreign nations. It's a free for all. Returning to Jesus's sheep and shepherd metaphor, I've learned that sheep are not very smart. They are herd animals, and they may follow each other right off the edge of a cliff to their own destruction. And we see this now. There are megachurch pastors who insist on gathering a crowd for worship. Governors are opening states in defiance of the recommended timeline of the president and medical experts. Meat packers are ordered back to work at risk of sickness and death. And some people refuse to social distance or wear masks because they have been led to believe that COVID-19 is a liberal hoax. We see many following poor leadership at grave risk. Not only this, but because we are all connected and state lines don't present much of a barrier, one person's folly can lead to another person's destruction. It's a messy sheep pen. And this leads me to another point. Notice that Jesus says it is his sheep who hear his voice, and his own sheep are the ones he brings out. Now we have a picture of a mixed pen, like the old commons in our colonial towns, where various shepherds have brought their flocks to pasture or shelter together. The sheep do indeed know the voices of their own shepherds and respond to them. In this sense, Jesus is one of many shepherds, but for us, he is the only good shepherd and the only gate to life lived abundantly. It may help us now to look at the experience of the community to which John was writing. We believe that they were late first century Jewish Christians living after the destruction of the temple and in contention and conflict with other Jews who did not accept Jesus as Messiah. Many of their members who still followed Jewish traditions were being banned from synagogues. So they were a beleaguered community facing resistance and experiencing abandonment. In the midst of destructive conflict then, they were learning to reform themselves as a new community gathered by Christ in his name alone. It may help us to look a chapter earlier into a healing story in John 9. Jesus' Good Shepherd discourse follows and flows directly from the story of his healing of a man born blind. This story mirrors the experience of John's community. The young man's physical healing from blindness is almost immediate. His sight is restored. However, the process of his spiritual healing or the spiritual opening of his eyes takes some time and coincides with increasing pushback from religious leaders who interrogate him and demonize Jesus who has healed him. No one celebrates his healing. On the contrary, he finds he's being treated almost like a criminal. 
This pushes the young man to pursue an understanding of what Jesus means to him. He is a sheep who comes to recognize the voice of Jesus among all the competing voices. He gains not only his sight, but as he discerns the voice of Jesus, he also gains his own voice defending Jesus. And as a result, he's thrown out. Here I, I always misremember thinking he goes in pursuit of Jesus, but this is not what happens. Jesus, the good shepherd, comes to him and he becomes a disciple. So yes, Jesus comes for his own. And the story of the young man born blind always touches me because before this, he makes his living as a beggar. He is at the very bottom of the social ladder and no one expects him to develop his own perspective or speak with his own voice. But the healing that begins with Jesus spreading mud on his eyes, touching him, leads to a much greater healing. It is a process. A similar process of spiritual formation happens for the new community, the church. John's community is shaped by conflict and resistance. Over time, by sustaining itself in the midst of conflict, cruelty, and chaos, and by staying connected to the voice of Jesus, the community gains its spiritual sight and collective voice. So how can we apply the birth of this new community, a kind of baptism by fire, to our current situation? For one thing, I would say that more and more in the midst of conflict and chaos, we are learning to discern the voice of Christ and seek to follow him out to safety even if the following out must continue for the time being in our own homes where we find safety. At the right time, he will lead us out of the sheep pen. I would also say, like the early church Luke describes in our Acts reading, we are learning to trust in the Holy Spirit indwelling among us. Although the young church after Pentecost retained its connection to the temple, it was also growing into the new gifts of the Spirit, healings and wonders done by the apostles, a rich spiritual life at home, mutually supportive fellowship, and radical sharing. Retaining its old roots, the community lived into its new gifts. So we know our roots. But where are the gifts? We, mean, we may not be seeing bona fide miracles like those performed by the apostles, but yet we have witnessed some wondrous and awe-inspiring events, both inside and outside the fellowship of the church, and we celebrate them. We have seen birthday parades. I heard just today of a school principal who drove, what did they say, 800 miles, uh, making the rounds so that he could visit each and every one of his graduates, of course, at a safe distance. We've seen fundraisers and celebrations offered by communities of famous entertainers come together to offer their gifts. We've seen the city of New York come out in the evening to applaud its medical workers. We have seen people providing pizza deliveries for hospital staff. We've experienced wonderful mutual support in our congregation where we have tried to ensure that everyone receives groceries or meals and that, that no one doesn't have the opportunity for a phone call, a connection with the church. We have seen people staffing our food pantries. We've seen the stories of businesses that voluntarily rework their processes, changing, for example, the brewing of an apple cider into the making of hand sanitizer. We've seen volunteer, volunteer nurses come together and create a community of their own, from their own homes and families. 
So as we were coming home and away from the physical gathering and fellowship of our church, what are the gifts that you could name? What have you witnessed? And how have you learned to discern or how are you learning to discern the voice of Jesus in the midst of the many voices and trust in the indwelling Holy Spirit? Although I cannot say that I've always appreciated the tough times we're in, who they are tough, I always believe that through them, our relationship with God in Christ will be strengthened inside or outside, gathered in one place or in our homes. We are the church. Christ is with us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's turn now to the prayer of the day. O oh God, our shepherd, you know your sheep by name and lead us to safety through the valleys of death. Guide us by your voice that we may walk in certainty and security to the joyous feast prepared in your house through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.